When people talk about the markets, it's easy to think of it as faceless, something that happens high above us. But the market is made up of people, millions of them, constantly at work. Every price set by a willing buyer finding a willing seller. There's a pristine elegance to it. But what if that simple price matching mechanism is broken? In example after example, case after case, insiders are exploiting their advantage. It's as though everything is rigged. The great rigging scandal has spread far and wide indeed, shaking three continents and probably more parts. The way it seems to work is that there's a few smaller insider actors who almost always have them, and they have more information than everybody else. Wall Street has been expecting to see a securities fraud case against Cohen for alleged insider trading. You can't rely on the price of anything anymore. Everything from swaps to food prices to currencies to interest rates, it's all suspect now. Ronald Rajaratnam was found guilty of masterminding the biggest insider trading ring in a generation. On Wall Street, they all laugh at the idea that the ordinary retail consumer is going to get a fair shot if he tries to enter these markets and make decisions. The idea that it's a rigged game is, is basically commonplace now. No, nobody disputes that. It may very well be one of the largest instances of bank orchestrated fraud in the history of the world. I came to Wall Street, the capital of capital markets, at a time when investing was being pitched as something for everyone. In the late 90s, stocks were booming. There was a sense that if you could get your savings into the hands of the right entrepreneur, you'd hit the jackpot too. Investing wasn't just for professionals anymore. Anyone could do it. It felt good to be part of that. I believed in it. When I worked here, I remember feeling excited to be here, not just because of the energy of the place, but because it does matter. Markets are important. The way they work, that they function properly, is important. Hey, Joe, I stand corrected. I'm just going to come out of NASA. You got a 34 low run. Come on. You know you want to go up. You know, when I think about it, for me, the markets have always been about very real things. All this activity, it's not gambling. It's about real businesses that need real money. They get it from investors, investors who place their faith in them, and then they take the money to grow and build something. So all of this, this trading, this price activity, is about that. The minute investors can't trust it, the minute a price isn't real or something is rigged, the minute it's not fair, Something really important breaks down. Far from Wall Street and the prices it sets, a reminder that when markets are meddled with, somewhere in the real world, someone pays for it. In fact, there's tangible examples to be found along the streets and throughout the neighborhoods of Detroit. As harmless as it looks, a story of manipulation may be found in a quiet warehouse. Goldman Sachs has collected $5 billion over the past three years for simply storing the luminous. They just move it around their warehouse literally on forklifts. And then they charge a storage fee on top of that. So that's how they're making their $5 billion. Why is this such a big deal? Well, a New York Times investigation has discovered that Goldman Sachs is creating an artificial shortage of aluminum by buying warehouses that store the commodity and then delaying the shipping process up to 16 months. Here to tell me how. This is the financial district. It doesn't get much further from Wall Street than this, the east side of Detroit and this aluminum warehouse. Inside of here, aluminum is stored for customers who need it. The longer it sits here, the more they pay, the more we pay for the end price of the good. This isn't about traders or numbers on paper. This is real business with real costs. 
New York Times reporter David Kochineski broke the story after spending months investigating. You're expecting to see warehouses, you know, being a beehive of activity, and this is Detroit where factories work three shifts around the clock if that's what's needed. So this warehouse looks pretty quiet. And when you get there, it is like a desolate, totally abandoned thing. This would be a loaded dock, presumably, but shutters are down and it doesn't look like it's been opened in a while. A warehouse so busy it can't keep up with demand from customers would probably look busy to its neighbors. A lot going on in there. Miguel Cruz is a handyman who's lived a few doors away from the warehouse for five years. Uh, nobody's ever said anything about the place in the neighborhood because, I mean, it essentially doesn't exist. I mean, I'm assuming everybody's thinking the same thing I'm thinking. It doesn't exist, so it's abandoned from what I had thought. Through a subsidiary named Metro International, Goldman owns 27 warehouses around Detroit. In them, aluminum for customers who pay rent to store it there. The longer the metal is in these warehouses, the more Goldman makes. The allegation that Goldman intentionally slows delivery of the metal, shuffling it between warehouses instead of out to customers. An absurd juggling act at the expense of those customers and one that potentially increases the price in the process. We asked Goldman Sachs for a response. They declined to make anyone available for an interview and emailed a statement denying the allegations. There are reports of workers who describe the movement of metal and, amazingly, video one worker shot in secret. There's these huge stacks of metal and you could bowl down the middle of the aisles because no one's there, no one's doing anything, and it's just sitting there. And every day, every hour, the metal sits there, Goldman's collecting rent on it. Everyone pays. Everyone uses aluminum, right? If you drink canned soda or canned beer, um, if you buy aluminum foil, if you have aluminum siding on your house or windows, everyone uses it. Um, so literally everyone is paying for this. Insider trading is one of the oldest and least sophisticated ways of rigging a market. At a hedge fund called Galleon, it became the norm. Mr. Rajaratnam, are you going to testify in your own defense? Raj Rajaratnam ran the fund. He's in jail now, serving a sentence of 11 years. It was standard practice at Galleon to pay for information from corporate insiders and then trade on it. Federal agents recorded a series of conversations between Rajaratnam and other traders. Well, one thing we know, this is very confidential, is that um, somebody is going to put a term sheet for expansion. Expansion is a $3 stock, right? Right. I haven't bought any. I am going to, I, I asked him, should I buy it, right? Yeah. He's like, no. You know, between a term sheet and negotiations, it's only be a month we can buy, you know? Yeah, yeah. But this is the one that we also have to make sure that we keep our conversations as privileged to the three of us. You know, we just have to be careful, right? Galleon was a very, very intense environment, and the, the bottom line was make money. And if, if you weren't adding to, you know, the end goal, you're, you're kind of useless. Tony Duff worked at Galleon. He's written a book about Wall Street, one that makes it clear this kind of behavior is commonplace. Insider trading wasn't on the forefront of, of my mind or, you know, I think most of the street um, because there weren't consequences. And a lot of the decisions that I made and probably a lot of other people also wasn't based on right and wrong. It was based on consequence. And didn't feel like we were going to get caught, you know. It felt like jaywalking. Does it get lost in there that these are real businesses? Oh, God, you know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, they're just symbols. That mentality may be part of the problem. The ultimate insiders with little consideration for the real-world consequences. It's a troubling issue that journalist Matt Taibbi has explored in depth. It's a very insular community, this, this, this financial community. It's a very small group of people making 
very, very weighty decisions, uh, you know, not just about prices, but about all kinds of things. I think these guys just, you know, they, to them it's not real, it's just a bunch of numbers on the paper. They don't realize that they're monkeying around with the pensions of people in ordinary, you know, little towns in America and all around the world, or, you know, the life savings of, of retired people. They're just not clued into exactly what it is that they're doing, and they just think they're making a little money for themselves and cutting corners. The wide-ranging insider trading probe that stretched from Wall Street to corporate boardrooms has netted a very big fish. Raj Rajaratnam found guilty on 14 It's true, the occasional fraudster does go to jail. But if this is truly a universal problem of culture, then for everyone caught, there's a sense of a near-endless supply of others who carry on unchecked. Richard Zabel is a prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice. His job, and that of others like him, to catch the people who are messing with the markets. There's a sense that not enough has been done from a prosecutorial point of view. Where are the people who we can point to to say they're paying a price? I think be very few people would ever say that this office was not an aggressive office. So, you know, we have some of the most powerful people in the hedge fund industry are now in prison. You know, I understand there's always going to be people in the public who think there should be more cases and you should prosecute more people and more entities. And our job is to really keep kind of a level head about it and be fair. Um, you don't want your prosecutors reacting only to public pressure one way or the other. You want your prosecutors to be working very hard to enforce the laws. I wouldn't say we're perfect. Uh, no one's perfect at it. Um, it's a hard business. You have to get lucky too sometimes. For one thing, for the Justice Department, these are very difficult cases to bring. So, you know, think about it from the point of view of a federal prosecutor. You have a, a limited number of resources, uh, say, in your district. You can either make 40 cases against street drug dealers, or you can make one or two cases against one of these banks, and you might not win. The message is that corruption is rampant, and that uh, if you get caught, it's just the cost of doing business. You have to pay a fine to somebody. It doesn't come out of your own pocket. It comes out of the shareholders' pockets. So why not? I mean, you think about all the worst actors in the financial crisis. You know, they're, they're not poor today. They kept all their money. And uh, I think everybody who goes into the business now knows that. When we come back, a market rigging scandal that shocked the world. Just in terms of size, it was the biggest financial scandal in history. There are parts of the international finance market that seem devoid of human life, but in fact are made up of countless individuals playing a role. In one of the most shocking market rigging stories of all, the world learned that a key interest rate, the London Interbank Overnight Rate, or LIBOR, was being manipulated for profit. LIBOR is a benchmark meaning thousands of other financial transactions we make, from student loans to mortgages, are priced off of it. If the price of LIBOR was being rigged, the prices that followed, well, it's as though they're all a mirage. And that's the way a lot of these, these crimes work. They're not, they're not taking a million dollars from one person in one, one day. They're taking little bits here and there over and over again, and they're doing it 500 million times. And they're doing it from every town and municipality in the country, and it adds up to enormous sums of money, but people don't immediately feel it. Astonishingly, in our high-tech world, LIBOR is still set the way it was 100 years ago, over the phone, trader to trader. It's an arcane system, and one that was wide open to abuse. And where abuse can happen, it seems, sickeningly, it will. And so, young traders, charged with setting a benchmark that affects millions of people, talked about manipulating it, as though it were little more than a game. Some of their exchanges have surfaced. Get six months as high as you can. My guy has an enormous fix on Wednesday in six months and will want it as high as possible. We'll be supplying you with copious amounts of curry. Cheers. The communications were so crazy and sociopathic, and yet the public really didn't respond to it when it came out. I thought it was strange. You know, if you think about it, 
just in terms of size, it was the biggest financial scandal in history, and yet it got almost no press here in America at all. So I, I was really struck by that one. The banks and hedge funds involved in scandals often do wind up paying hefty fines, 2.3 billion in the case of LIBOR alone, amounts that sound large to us but become the equivalent of a speeding ticket to these giant financial entities. It all inevitably leads to the same question. Who is safeguarding the markets? There's a concern that regulators can't possibly keep up. They're outmanned, they're deficient in resources, but also that they lack the expertise. That big financial players actually have endless amounts of creativity and energy to find new ways to make money even if those ways come at the expense of other market participants, regular folks, retail investors, people like us. One of those regulators is Bart Chilton at the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission. A lot of the price manipulation has happened in his backyard. We have a publicly sworn duty to try and ensure these markets are efficient, effective, devoid of fraud, abuse, and manipulation. That's good for markets, it's good for consumers, and it's good for the economic engine of our democracy. You'd agree, though, that regulators didn't get a really great grade leading up to the credit crisis? Because we didn't have the available tools that we needed. We were told, go take a siesta. Now we have the tools, now it's our job. The only problem we don't have is we don't have all the resources we need to have the cops on the beat. We have the law on our side but we don't have the cops on the beat to go out there and check on everybody. What does it say about the mentality in Washington if you're not given the resources you need? It says that they don't care enough about this. And unfortunately, you know, Congress in general and government is very reactive. What I think will happen, unfortunately, because I don't think we're going to get the resources we need, is some other big debacle we'll have, and then all of the do-gooders will come in and fund us after the fact. It'll be another painful learning lesson, hopefully one that doesn't impact actual average folks. It's not, you know, banks like Barclays and, and Goldman Sachs and Citigroup that are losing uh, whenever we hear about manipulation of interest rates or swaps or whatever it is. It's, you know, it's towns, it's ordinary people, it's people who have mortgages or credit cards. Those are the people who are always losing. So. I get the idea that it all evens out, it is some kind of price in the end, uh, there is some kind of stability to it, but it does seem like it's weighted, uh, you know, certain people always win and certain people always lose. In other words, while insiders profit, we pay the price. But the markets don't just belong to the insiders, they belong to all of us. It's time to sit up and take notice and hold them accountable before it's too late. Amanda Lang, CBC News, New York.